And we're going to be basing a lot of our analysis on the teachings of this great elder and the saint of our church, uh, Athanasius Metellineus. So it's taking, this is taking, I'm taking this from homily 162, given in 1991 on the Acts of the Apostles. And he is talking about the council in Jerusalem, the apostolic council in Jerusalem. And he's presenting, as he says, a... Uh, a, a v, a, an analysis or a look at this council from the opposite, from the uh, underneath, as it were, uh, uh, and not not from the positive orthodox perspective, but from what a is not a council, is not an orthodox council. And he's analyzing in his, in his day the preparations for what will eventually become the Council of Crete. So this is this is the Pan Orthodox Council, or the uh, what some were calling in his day the Eighth Ecumenical Council, which was very mistaken. Uh, but uh, in any case, it's what eventually ended up being the Cretan Council. They were they had been preparing it already in his day for thirty years, and then when it finally came about, it was almost fifty years of preparation. Uh, so uh, this is this is doubly important. All right, so we have an analysis of this attempt at this council. And, of course, he's following an agreement with the saints, like St. Eustin Kovovich in his analysis, but also gives us some insight into where this council, this false council in Crete, was going to lead or is leading, and also what is the temptation, the great temptation that we're facing and that we will face in the end times. Uh, he gives us an analysis of, of, of Revelation 3.10 in this context. So let's just hear what he has to say, and we'll, we'll give some comments as we go. He says, with regard to the Pan-Orthodox Council or the attempt at a great and holy council that was being prepared, do you know that this is a temptation for the church throughout the world? Yes, a temptation. Do you know that what it will seek to accomplish? And do you know why it is a temptation? Because... It will strive, it should be, it will strive to dim or to diminish, or to fade, the Greek word could be translated differently, the theanthropic face or person of Jesus Christ, all right? Why is this a temptation? Because it will attempt, it will strive to dim, diminish, fade away the theanthropic person or face of Jesus Christ. That which Arius failed to do, and monophysism could not accomplish, ecumenism, as established as its goal. That's Father Athanasius Metellineo's uh, stance. When the human and divine aspects of the person of Jesus Christ are faded away, what do we have? What do we have? The temptation appears to be in the last of human history. This is going to be the last temptation for the church, the great threat and challenge to the church in human history, according to great elder Athanasius. A terrible temptation, he says. It has been prophesied. Christ has prophesied it. And it is found in the book of Revelation. Listen to what he says. And he's quoting now 310 and 311. Because thou hast kept the word of my patience, I will also keep thee from the hour of temptation, which shall come upon all the world to try them that dwell upon the earth. It shall come upon all the world. Note, upon all the world, all right? Very important, this temptation. It's not a local temptation. It's a global temptation. Found, sound familiar? Looks, we're getting a little bit closer to the end times. We have global temptations now. All right, it's a temptation to come upon the whole world. Behold, I come quickly. Hold that fast which thou hast, that no man take thy crown. All right, we're going to come back to this in a moment. He says, because you have guarded or observed the word of my patience, that is, with regard to that which you have been patient and have kept me, the Lord, within you in the midst of adverse conditions, so too will I guard you. So you have kept, I will also keep you. I will guard you. From what will I guard you? By the way, this could also be applied to the church. We just got done talking about the idea that if you've not kept the faith, presupposition, then God's not going to keep you, right? So 
You can't talk about the church without the holy faith being kept and confessed. From the hour of temptation, he will guard us. That temptation which is coming upon the entire world, a very great temptation. He says, I will come quickly, keep well that which you have, and no one take the crown and honor. I can pretty much restates again the scriptural passage with his few minor changes, his own words. Pay attention here. What is this temptation? What is this temptation? It is written, this temptation, since it will cover the entire earth, it will be nothing else than the great adulteration of the faith, of faith in the theanthropic person of Jesus Christ. So the great temptation is the great adulteration, nothia in Greek, right? Perversion, adulteration of the faith. This will be accomplished only by ecumenism, according to the great elder. By the way, he has many, many uh, teachings and excerpts from his ta talks, thousands of talks that he gave. He has many, many, many wonderful, amazing, insightful, deep patristic analysis of ecumenism, of the heresy, the ecclesiological heresy of ecumenism, not just the ecumenical movement as an historical reality, but the ecclesiological delusion and heresy of ecumenism. So this will be accomplished only by ecumenism, this, this nothea, this fading away of the theanthropic person of Christ, since it will unite with the other religions. It will bring about the unity of Christianity with the religions, okay? We're gonna talk about that in a moment. What form will that take? Uh, and then he repeats it in, the, in this lecture that he's giving. Since it will unite with the other religions. He actually very strongly repeats it. And he says, forgive me for repeating it again and again. But he wants to drive it home to us. That this is the end of ecumenism, right? This is where it's going to end up. It's going to unite Christianity. We don't believe in Christianity. We believe in Christ. And he is the church throughout history, right? We believe in the church. Christianity is not a, a religion. We don't believe in a religion. We don't have an ideology. But this idea among the heterodox and then the humanists who will join them, they, those who practice Christianity as a religion, they will unite with the other religions. They will become like them, right? Their likeness will unite them. They don't have to unite externally, but their spirit, their mentality, their way, the way they think about Christ and living in Christ will become so foreign to the church that they will unite themselves to the various religions. So ecumenism is preparing the ground for that. In this way, ecumenism essentially denigrates the philanthropic person of Christ to the point of entirely erasing it, right? If you unite Christ with the other religions, or you see him as in the other religions as one, as does perennialism, we'll talk about that in a minute, well, then you basically erase him uh, in terms of the revelation of Jesus Christ that we have received, the philanthropic person of Christ. You identify him with the religions which are inspired by demons. You identify him with, and you see him as the, the Arians, as a man, and therefore you can unite Christ and the church with the various religions. They're all tending toward the same end. And there's a text in Vatican II uh, which uh, deals with that. That's another topic though. Uh, if, however, ecumenism works to wipe out the philanthropic person of Christ, that which the Antichrist will do, then what is ecumenism? It is an Antichrist method, Antichrist way. This is the elder talking. I'm quoting the elder. Pay attention. When certain leaders and rulers of high standing in the church give their speeches, they often do not refer to God, the Holy Trinity, nor to Jesus Christ. Pay attention when you see that happening. To what do they refer? To God. To God. But God could also refer to the great architect of the universe, the God of the Masons. And so in order to serve and please their all wretched masters, they avoid saying the name of Christ or the name of God, the Holy Trinity. And they only say God. Read the speeches of great personages, and you will see. He's talking about ecclesiastical leaders right, in the Orthodox Church. 
All right, so this is 1991, brothers and sisters. This man was a prophet. He was already talking about and seeing what we have seen clearly uh, again and again since those days, unfortunately. He actually talks about an, an event, uh, the elder George of Gregorio, who went to a, a early days as a professor before he was a monk at Manathos, went to America for a conference, and they came up to Elder George and they said, among the Orthodox humanists and others, please don't mention the name of Jesus Christ because there are some people here who are attending who don't believe in Jesus Christ. They were Protestants. Uh, I think they were the Protestant Pentecostal sect who doesn't believe in the divinity of Christ or something, or some of the Protestants who are Aryan in belief. And he was asked not to mention the name of Jesus Christ. He actually, he actually quotes that experience that Elder George had and related to Elder uh, Athanasios. Um, so what's going on, Elder Athanasios? When, however, the faith is slighted, apostasy ensues, right? About which the Apostle Paul writes, and which in its wake brings about departure from the ethos. So he's saying, look, we have this departure from faith, all right? This ecumenism brings about a falling away from the theanthropic person. And it brings about also, unavoidably, a departure from the ethos, from the moral life. And who can deny, he says, that we have apostasy and consequently a challenge to morality? If that was true in 91, how much more today with transgenderism and all the rest? It's only gotten 10 times, 1,000 times worse than 1991. And then he was saying, look how bad it is. We can see a total apostasy and a falling away from the ethos. He says, if we had the faith, he's talking about Orthodox Greece in 1991. If we had the faith, we would not have had a crisis of, of ethos or morality either. And what does Christ say? He says, because you kept the word of my patience, what is this here, the word of the patience of Christ? It is the patience which Christ gives to those who have made the decision to remain close to, pay attention, he says, the unadulterated Christ. All right, think about the unadulterated Christ that he's talking about in the context of Vatican II ecclesiology, where they've embraced a Christ who has adulterations, has perversions, distortions, and they still talk about Christ, the church, the body of Christ, and incorporation into Christ. All right, so here clearly, those who embrace Vatican II ecclesiology have abandoned the unadulterated Christ. And that ecclesiology is an ecclesiology of ecumenism, and therefore it's an antichrist method, an antichrist uh, way of talking about, experiencing, thinking about Christ. And when you have that disintegration, that dis, that uh, disdain for the unadulterated Christ, then you have antichrist methodology and mission and, and, and mentality. So this is very important teaching uh, by our great elder Athanasios. Uh, the he is telling us that it will come on the ecclesiological plane as well, as well as the Christological. So the denial of the theanthropic nature of the church, this is what's at stake here. 